Welcome back to the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network. This is the MMA Takeover with Keith Schillen. I am, of course, the host, Keith Schillen. This is the brand new show on the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network. This is the second episode, the sophomore episode, and couldn't have happened at a better time. The week of UFC 246, the big return of Conor McGregor, who takes on Donald Cerrone this Saturday at T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. Before we get to the show, let me just take some brief seconds, do some housekeeping. Uh, we at Loudmouth are very proud to be the new partner with Sports Talk Radio, which is a 24-hour internet radio station that covers all sports, football, basketball, hockey, the Olympics, fantasy sports, whatever. Well, I mean, basically everything. And we do most of the MMA coverage there from Monday through Friday from 12 noontime to 1 on the East Coast, Eastern Standard Time. Our shows will be on. This is one of the shows we'll be on. The only difference if you're a usual listener to the podcast network is that occasionally on a show like this, show on like off the cuff that we just had, that we have a quick break seven, eight second break. You'll hear a little bit of music that is for the internet radio. That's where they'll put in ads. We're proud being part of loudmouth to not have any ads. If you listen to our network, there is no ads, but if you're listening on the internet, unfortunately you will have to listen to some ads to pay the bills. But speaking of pay the bills, no one pays the bills like Conor McGregor and as he returns, we had the press conference this past week, and boy, was that press conference something. We have this brand new Conor McGregor, the nice Conor McGregor, Conor McGregor that we've never seen before, a guy that he was complimenting Donald Cerrone. At one point, they were talking about each other's clothing, and Conor was giving a, uh, Cerrone credit for his jacket and it would not. This is not what the Conor we saw. Usually Conor's a guy who's getting in the face, jumping over, stealing the belt from Jose Aldo. And that's not what we saw. We see this nice Conor now. I'm going to get in the second segment. I'm going to speak to Colin Crandall, who is a media member. He is the lead host of the MMA Power on Fight TV. He's there in Vegas. He actually asked some of the questions during the press conference. He'll be in the second segment, giving all his thoughts on the ground right there in Las Vegas. In the third segment, I'm going to give all my predictions for every single fight on the card. It's going to be a very pretty quick, glazed over. Uh, we have the breakdown show. We have uh, the all angles, which I do down for which is a much more in-depth breakdown. But that's not what that is. But we're going to save those predictions. We're going to save those for the third segment. But to this, so back to the press conferences. There was two kind of camps is that one camp that loved it they love this new connor they, they think he's focused they think they're sick of the animosity they're sick of the wwe type antics and then you have the other camp which is like wait this isn't the connor we know the one thing we about connor you know the first thing he's known for is obviously brutal knockouts knocking out jose alto in 13 seconds being in new york city piecing up eddie alvarez Having two belts over show, of course he's known for that. The second thing he's known for is the money, the glamour, the transcending the sport, taking the sport to a whole nother level. But the third thing he's known for is his trash talk. I mean, how many times, if you're an MA fan, have you watched a highlight video just showing Connor at his best, talking trash, looking over saying, you know, who the bleep is that guy in reference to Jeremy Stevens? Uh, the telling Donald Cerrone that he is stiff and slow and stuck in the mud and telling Chad Mendes he's going to rest his his nuts on his head or whatever he said, you know, just these classic things that he, he said. Because he talked this big game and then backed it up is one of the biggest reasons why Conor McGregor became such a star in our sport. And to see this whole different side of Conor it's weird, and I was I kept what I was watching. I almost like felt for like the sh- what's the worst of saying the shooter drop or like I was waiting for like all right, where's the big surprise? Like, 
when's the twist? When's that like six cents ending a six cents where we like, oh, it was it was a hit, it was a trick ending all along, and that just didn't happen. I mean, he's smiling, he's shaking hands with Donald Cerrone, and and maybe it's because of some of the things we've seen in the past, the oversaturation of Conor McGregor. I mean, you go back to the Floyd Mayweather where they had the that multi city tour and they went to London and they went to New York City and Toronto and I don't I don't remember where else they went. Somebody else it was and by the fourth one it, it seemed like we, we were kind of sick of seeing it and it kind of got a little um annoying the way they were trash talking and it it, it just wasn't natural anymore. And and we go to the Habib, you know, did he learn from the mistakes he made in the Habib you know, he crossed the line, talked about the man's religion, talked about his family, and they like very, very personal. Going after, you know, not a popular figure in MMA, but uh, Habib's manager Ali Abdelaziz talking about his personal thing. Like maybe Khan is realizing that that this, you know, he's crossing the line, so he wants to be nice. So what camp am I in? I'm in the second camp. I was bored i want to see kind of trash talk now there's a lot of people on twitter who say well if you need trash talk you're cash fan that's stupid that's stupid i've been watching anime since ufc 6 was the first one i'm i'm as hardcore as come i just did a two-hour podcast on the fight itself so you know with john franklin and the all angles like those you can't say that i'm not a hardcore fan. i'm doing a freaking podcast for pete's sake but i was just bored as when i tune into a conor mcgregor press conference I want to see some trash talk. It doesn't have to be, you know, over the top and annoying, but just little clever things. But to me, the highlight of the entire press conference is when he was talking about being able to read Cerrone, which somebody, I can't remember who it was, but somebody asked him, you know, what what's the biggest threat or biggest skill set you have to be worried about with Cerrone? And he's like, well, I can just read him like a book. And he was kind of downplaying Cerrone and basically like, saying he's so much better like that's that was exciting that little brief couple seconds was it it's exciting and that's what i want and i think kind of may be making it now obviously i'll be wrong we'll find out on saturday but i think kind of maybe being i don't know what the word I'm like, he may be just making a mistake i mean think about it. i have two reasons why i think the nice connor is making a mistake the first one one of the narratives that got Conor McGregor has always been that he gets in his opponent's head before it even happens. I'm going all the way back to his fight with Jose Aldo right before when both guys entered the cage, right before they fought. Now, Jose Aldo was a guy. He had this huge winning streak, undefeated for years, most decorated champion. At that time, the only featherweight champion in history. I mean, he seemed invincible. But somehow Connor threw the the continuous like nagging at him with the trash talk, getting in his head, putting self doubt. You started seeing Jose Aldo, Aldo like stressed, and right before they fought, Joe Rogan actually said it. Joe Rogan said something like, "Connor McGregor is uncanny how how loose he is." And then he talked about Jose Aldo and he said, he, you can see it, it appears that he has all the effects of stress on him, that he's feeling that moment. Uh, think about Nate Diaz. When Nate Diaz called out his infamous, Connor, you stole everything from me. You know, I want to fight you kind of thing. You stole everything I work for. At one point he says, I'm the real fight, not those clowns that you already punked at the press conference. You know that's the easy fight or, or something like that. You know you already won, something like that. I mean, Nate Diaz is saying it. Connor's beating guys mentally. Donald Cerrone is a guy who doesn't like – he's been on record. He doesn't like trash talk. He thinks a part of the game that he wished didn't exist. I remember Alexander Hernandez was trying to get underneath this game of trash talk, and, and Cerrone was able to just basically sidestep it. But that sidestep in Alex Hernandez, a guy that seems like he's forcing the trash talk, not just a guy who just it comes natural to him. That's not Connor. It comes natural to Connor. Could he be able to sidestep it? And now imagine this, this is the bigger thing. It's the biggest star in the sport. You have all these fans. Like if you know, he's already going to be the least popular fighter. I mean, I mean, I know there's a lot of people supporting Cerrone. A lot of people are just hate on Connor. They want to see Cerrone win just because they hate Connor. 
But besides that, kind of fills up arenas. He's popular. The Irish fans travel. And if he could be in that situation, talking trash, the crowd going crazy with everything he's saying, that might have got in the head of Donald Serrano. Think about this. Colin Crandall, the guy that we're going to have on in a couple minutes, he asked Cerrone about, about I don't know exactly what the question was, but basically Cerrone answered him saying, the narrative about me is that I can get to the upper echelon, but when it's a big fight, I always lose. And he said, well, let's see. This is the biggest fight I've ever had. He's, he's admitting that this is big, that this, you know, that, is that showing that this is getting to him? I don't know. But if there's a chance when you can get in someone's head and Connor didn't take it, I think that was a mistake. The other thing is we spoke to Ben Duffy earlier this week. The, the buzz for Connor McGregor is not there. The buzz for his sake, the, the, the magnitude. I mean, we're only uh, uh, you know just over a day away until they get in the cage and it doesn't have the buzz. Now, of course, this is following up Floyd Mayweather fight, the Habib fight. These were historical things. But I had Ben Duffy, and he was agreeing. He was saying that Con- that Conor McGregor is not drawing the same buzz. Why? I don't know. The excitement isn't there. Well, maybe this was Conor's chance to get it back. Now, why in the excitement? There's a, there's probably a lot of reasons. I think one of it is kind of out of sight, out of mind. He hasn't fought in so long. It's been three years since he's actually been that dominant force, the one that – that we started believing that if he said something, he could back it up. If he said, I'm going to win two belts, he's then he does it. We're like, holy crap. And then if he said he's going to win three belts, we might stop believing with three belts. I mean, there was people, Connor which spoke things into existence, it seemed like. When he was saying he was going to beat Floyd Mayweather, there was a lot of people that was actually thinking it was going to happen. Now, the, of course, the majority of people did not believe that Connor McGregor was going to beat Floyd Mayweather. But – there was people based on things he said. But now after seeing him lose to Floyd Mayweather with boxing, which I think he should get a pass for. I think most people generally say, but still, if you paid the pay-per-view you're, and you want to see Conor McGregor and you thought he could win, by the way, and then you saw him lose, get knocked out, or TKO. I mean, he wasn't dropped on the seat, but TKO'd by Floyd Mayweather, you might be upset. And then you're like, well, you know, it's not boxing. MMA is this thing. He's going against Habib, and you're on this. You have in your mind that he's going to win, and then he loses in a fight that wasn't close. He was mauled. Habib submitted him. And if you tuned in and you saw him lose, so now you spent, I don't know how much money the Floyd made. was something stupid, like 90 bucks, 75 bucks, 100 bucks. I don't know what it was. And then you drop another 70 bucks to see the Habib fight. And you've seen Conor lose two in a row. So it's been so... Now you've seen him lose the last two fights. You see, and you know, it's been forever since he was the champion of the UFC. And then outside of that, he's had these run-ins with the law, whether it be the Mark Garber jumping in and, and interrupting the Bellator fight, whether it be the right, throwing the dolly in, stealing the man's phone, punching the element, and then, of course, the sexual assault things. All you know, allegations, of course. Let me back up. I just want to say – actually, I got to put the word allegations there because we don't know if it's true, but he's being investigated right now. So all that up could really, really affect how excitement people are. Now, real quick, because we've got to go, go to a break. I got less than a minute. We're going to get to Colin Crandall and the next segment. I just want to say that the reporter there, his name uh, it escapes me. It's Morgan something. I apologize. I'll definitely pull it up before I get to Colin Crandall. For him to stand up and ask about the sexual assault allegations, I know that created a lot of stir. I actually I applaud that man for doing it. It you know, sorry, his name is Morgan Campbell. He writes for the Toronto Star. I I applaud that man. If it was any other athlete in any other sport, if it was Aaron Rodgers who plays for the Packers, the son, if he was being investigated for sexual assault allegations, of course the reporters would would talk about it. The NFL would have to talk about it. The Green Bay Packers would probably have to put a press release about it. That is the right time. The only chance you get a chance, and I applaud it for asking. But anyways, I run out of time. We'll be right back. Stay right there. We're gonna, we'll be right back with Colin Crandall from the MMA Power, who's on scene in Las Vegas.
We're back with the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network. This is the MMA Takeover with Keith Schillen. I am Keith Schillen, and I'm going to a special guest. I call him California Cool, but we really should call him the star of UFC 246 press conference from the MMA Power Hour on Fight TV, Colin Crandall. Colin, what's up, my man? Oh, good, brother. Always great to talk to you. My friend, you're one of my favorite journalists, and uh, the kind words mean a lot to me. I'm trying to do whatever I can to make some uh, some good impressions out here and to add uh, whatever is possible to add to this uh, amazing UFC 246 fight week. All right, so what I should say, so Colin's on location. He's going to be – he's been covering all week. He's, he was one of the guys that we, we would have saw at the press conference yesterday. He was doing media day. He's, he's got to do weigh-ins, everything like that. So, Colin, so one of the narratives we have out here is there's not a lot of buzz, especially for a Conor McGregor fight. Now, obviously, there's a lot of buzz, but not to the level that Conor normally gets. What's the feeling there on location in Vegas? Is there a lot of buzz for this fight? There, there is. People here are pretty darn excited. I mean, just the enormity of the event with Conor McGregor in it. There's three times the media uh, that was there uh, when I when I uh, hung out with you in Boston, or four times, literally. Uh, yeah. There's even double the media that was at uh, UFC 245 uh, just a month a month ago with the, the three title fights. Um, people are people are excited about it. Maybe not quite as in, as much anticipation as when it was Conor versus Nate Diaz or Conor versus Khabib, but people are excited. People really are. Uh, uh, Connor is, is seeming like a new Connor. He just has no animosity toward Cowboy. Uh, the press conference, there's no shenanigans. Uh, he's, um, I mean, you know, some people may be a little disappointed because the, the trash talk, uh, epic trash talk of the Irishman Connor uh, McGregor is not present at all, but he's being, a, he's being witty and fun and interesting. Okay. And uh, people are pretty excited about it. Do you, are you liking this? Not the nice guy Connor that we're seeing. This is the first time he's ever had an opponent where he's, I mean, he shook his hand. He's being respectful. Do you like this nice guy Connor? You know, it, it, I, I personally do. Cause as you know, being a good old Michigan boy from the Midwest, that's kind of what I believe that, that people think of me as, and I appreciate the credit you've given me as being huh. one of the nicer guys. So I like that. I, as far as okay. entertaining, I don't know. Um, I, one of the things I'm just waiting for is like all of a sudden when it comes to the, to the weigh-ins that he just totally gets in a cowboy's face or starts cursing at him or tries to punch him or maybe immediately starts talking trash and taunting him. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say because as we know, and this is one thing I discussed uh, in a question that I had for cowboy is they always said they've always said that the fighters that have had a great rapport with cowboy that have not thrown a bunch of antagonistic uh uh chatter at him or or tried to intimidate him or try to make things mean and nasty the fighters that have not done that usually end up losing to connor uh, sorry to cowboy uh thereby proving the fact that co- cowboy doesn't like to have animosity like it throws him yeah. and and so funny enough if that that being the case connor is playing right into his game sure. and so you know and that cowboy even said yeah i hear they, i hear you guys the media say if if someone hugs me then i knock them out so connor give me a big hug yeah. when we first yeah. get into the cage you know so i don't know it it, it, it really makes you wonder i mean it, does connor have something in store for him to completely flip the script or is Connor just doesn't care because he's that confident he's going to beat Cowboy? Yeah. Um, it's not as entertaining as the Conor McGregor usually has been, but it's 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 different. It's making people think and wonder, and he seems to be in a real good place. And not only that, he's probably uh, sick of the bad publicity, as is his management team probably, and so perhaps that's what's motivating him. So there's a lot to – you said a lot of things, so there's a lot to unwrap there. What I want to – I asked you, you talked about that – Cerrone's the guy, I mean, go back to the Alex Hernandez fight. He didn't, you know, when Alex Hernandez was trying to trash talk, he was like, come on, man, I'm too, I'm too old for this. I, you know, I'm not going to trash talk with you. Connor is a guy who's been known for his trash talk is what we've been used to. I mean, him and Habib took it to a whole new level with the yeah. you know, attack on Muslims, attack on his country, attack on his family. I mean, it was, it was crossing the line. That said, is Connor losing a little bit of the mental edge? Because one of the narratives we always hear about Connor is that he's already won the fight before they actually step in. I mean, in, in Nate Diaz's famous uh, call out of Connor, he actually said that. He said, Not these clowns, you've already punked at the press gods. You know, you already got them beat or something like that. 
do you feel like that Connor is making a mistake by not trash talking, by not, you know, getting in the head of Donald Cerrone? You know, very possibly so. I guess we'll definitely know uh, by around this time. Uh, uh, no, by a little later than this on Saturday night. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I think that, it 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 is odd and 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 it definitely is changing things up um i just part of me wonders if 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 connor is just so confident he's going to beat this man that he really is trying to show that he really doesn't care yeah. that he'll do whatever connor whatever makes cowboy comfortable uh and instead of cowboy winning when he's comfortable connor will still beat him and i think that may be Cow- connor's thought so i to me i don't I don't think it's really a big mistake because I think Connor is that confident and is the favorite going in about uh, about three to one. And uh, but it could be. I mean, he's, he's definitely not following the the uh, the uh, uh, best uh, uh, road or uh, the, the the most uh, road most traveled to defeat Cowboy yeah. uh, with uh, with creating animosity and uh, and uh, antagonizing him. Yeah, maybe it's like a, maybe by not trash talking, it's like a reverse psychology, and that, yeah. that might be strange. like maybe Cerrone was building up for this trash talk, and then it didn't happen. Now that might be messing with Donald Cerrone. Maybe thinking like, wow, he's that confident that he doesn't have to trash talk. He's already, you know, is, is there something he's seeing that I'm not? Um, so you've been there, you, you know, you've been there, you've been covering the media day, you covered the press conference, they had scrums. What's your one takeaway specifically with the? Cerrone McGregor what's the one takeaway from all this talk that that you really stood out to you um I guess what I get is that Connor is seeming to be more comfortable in his own skin and more grateful and he's mentioned that a few occasions he's very grateful for what he has um he's not angry I think he he mentioned even kind of buying into people antagonizing him, which is maybe how he got into some of the legal trouble, or at least that's the spin he'd like to put on why sure. he got into a lot of legal. Um, but I think that he's just in a really good space, uh, and 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 that he's very comfortable here, and he and he's happy to to help Donald Cerrone get a payday. He always looks at it that way. Is that they said people's eyes light up? They one reporter said. Usman's eyes light lit up and, and Masvidal's eyes lit up when talk of Connor and Connor said, yeah, everyone's eyes are going to light up when they talk about me because there's big money involved. You go from making a couple hundred grand to making, you know, several million dollars. So everyone's going to be happy and I'm happy to do it. He said in this case with, with Cowboy Cerrone. So the, the takeaway for me is that Connor is very relaxed, happy, and just feeling good about this whole event. And the takeaway with Cowboy, I mean, it's interesting. Cowboy, obviously is very happy that it's his biggest payday out there. Um, He is not apparently not cutting a lot of weight, but he's, he seemed a little bit on edge to me and a little bit annoyed. I don't know if someone pissed him off or the media obligations are not making him super happy, but he seems like in a way he seems like the normal relaxed cowboy, but there's also a bit of an edge. I, I, I don't know. Maybe he's feeling a little bit more pressure here because he is the underdog, and a lot of people are saying that he's that he might just be a stepping stone for Connor. Yeah, I mean the guy has more experience than I mean pretty much almost anybody who's ever fought in the UFC. He's experienced in the He's fought everybody, but he's never had a pro, uh, any fight at this high profile. And the fact that you know, we had those you know thirty second commercials on NFL playoffs that just featured Connor. Like it might be a little bit of, you know, most of the questions were towards Connor. They kept talking about how much Connor makes in the sport and all this. So there, so there, you might be absolutely right. I think you might be on something. So I want to ask you, you were there, the, probably the biggest moment of the press conference. Uh, it was by a gentleman by the name of Morgan Campbell. I believe his name is, he is with the Toronto star. Uh, he stood up and he asked Connor about the, allegations of the sexual assault right away donald Cerrone, who actually was the one who jumped in kind of cut him off said let's talk about the fight dana white said he's already answered those questions i'm in the fence that he didn't answer those questions he got a fluff question by errol hawani on a pure pr strategy by the ufc his team espn whatever to have him speak with ariel get it get it before the press conference so no one else can errol didn't even say the word sexual assault so let me ask this question. 
two part question. First part, are you okay with, with uh, Mr. Campbell asking the question, is it the right time, right place? Which I do. And two, is it appropriate for the UFC and them to not basically, and Connor to not answer the question? Good, very good questions on your part. Uh, there was a definite negative reaction when that was mentioned. Everyone started booing. But remember, there were fans there. I believe you're talking about the press conference sure. yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And the fans started booing. Everyone, they just, it, it really, I think, I think it clearly it was the elephant in the room. And um, a lot of people knew that that's something that would be interesting to talk about. But I think we're really embracing that this wasn't the venue uh, to uh, to discuss it. Uh, bottom line is the one guy was brave enough there that you mentioned to try it, and immediately the anger and the backlash in the whole room was was you know palpable. You could feel it. Everyone was like, "Shut the hell up! No talk about this shit now." Um, so so that's when you, say, you know, when you say back room, I. I who is you specifically? No, not to say any names. Are you talking about media members, like other media members saying like? I, I think a bunch of media and the fans, but maybe okay. the fans were loudest about just not wanting to hear it. Okay. Um, so, so, but do I think it was inappropriate? I mean, you know, there probably would have been a better time, but a guy has to try. I mean, that's what us media people yeah. are for. The guy's got to try and see if he's willing to talk about that because the fans are probably interested. Now, what do I feel about the UFC squashing that? I mean, it seems like that's the stance that they're taking. And if you really think about it, um, it, it probably would be counterproductive for them to embrace that uh, uh, in the promotion for this fight. They're wanting people to be excited about buying the next pay-per-view. Uh, they're not saying, you know, uh, uh, wanting to say, by the way, our guy might be a rapist and, a, and an abuser. Uh, but but please watch uh, him fight anyway. Sure. That's definitely not the message that they're wanting to give. So do I think uh, it's appropriate for them to squash it? I mean, I, I can't really make that judgment. I don't know, but probably if I was part of the PR team or the CEO or COO or or you know president uh, uh, of the UFC, probably I would say certainly this is not something we want to make part of the promotion for our big fight. Uh, you know, so I, it, it couldn't, it can't help, I would think, promote the event. And, and, and it would only put a negative spin on it because some fans don't know anything about this. The casual fans sure. uh, have no idea about this. And, and not only that, but if they heard about it, they may never watch the UFC again yeah. or, or a Conor McGregor fight sure. again. So that's probably the UFC's motivation on that. And, you know, whether it's good or bad, it's, it is what it is. So I got less than two minutes. So, Everyone has an opinion on the fight. Everyone has a prediction on the fight. I know you're a guy who likes – you like to break down fighters. Let's hear it. I mean, you're there. I know you got a different sense than us. You're up close to these guys. You can get a look at their eyes. You can get the feeling. You can, you can see who you, you think is comfortable and ready. Let's hear it. Let's hear what's your prediction. Who wins the fight between, you know, former double champion Conor McGregor and, and record w winner, you know, several records, Donald Cerrone. Who wins? You know, I think it's going to be an interesting fight. There was one question I had really wanted to ask to Connor for today, but they wanted to make sure that a lot of people that either weren't at the press conference yesterday or didn't have a chance uh, got the mic today, and they actually excluded uh, a lot of people on one side of the room where I was from from getting on it, and uh, including some senior journalists. But it is what it is. But I was going to ask Connor. A lot of people are saying Connor early, cowboy late because of talking about the gas tank being so sure. great for Cowboy, right, and not for Connor. Um, I don't think that's going to be an issue. I think if there was an issue there or in the past, I think it's been fixed. Uh, I think that uh, that Con Connor went at a great pace in that second fight with uh, Nate Diaz and definitely kept it up. I think he went at an amazing pace uh, in the Khabib fight and, and just was getting out grappled and worn down by a man that wears pretty much everyone down. So – I think this. I think that it's going to be Connor early, and it's going to be Connor late, and it's going to be Connor in the middle. Right. I think that this is Connor McGregor's fight. He's the younger, fresher man. He's okay. not that much smaller, and his chin is better. There's less miles on him, less wear and tear. Would I love to see the older veteran win? Yeah, I would love it. Would love it. Nothing against Connor. Love to see Cowboy pull off the upset, but I'm thinking Connor McGregor either takes this in the first round or in the second round by knockout. All right, guys, we ran out of time. But you heard it from the man on scene. That was Colin Crandall. He's taking Conor McGregor. Make sure you head over every Wednesday 
on Fight TV. Check out the MA Power with Colin Crane. Connell, thanks so much, man. My pleasure always, Keith. Keep up the great work, brother. Welcome back to the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network. This is the t- MMA Takeover Show with Keith Schillen. And, of course, I am Keith Schillen. But closing out the show, I want to thank Colin Crandall for the time, giving us some insight from a guy who's right there in Las Vegas talking to the fighters all this week, getting the best content out there over at the MMA Power Hour on Fight TV. So before we close it up, i got to give my predictions. Everyone else is saying who they think is going to win. I'm going to do the same. Now, obviously, my prediction for the Conor mcgregor Donald Cerrone fight is already out there. It's a very in-depth preview. It is out there on the All Angles podcast, a podcast I do with John Franklin right here on Loudmouth MMA. It's already out there. It is as deep of a breakdown of a fight as anybody can. The entire show just covers that one fight, and I challenge anybody to find a podcast that goes more in-depth than what me and John do. Also, if you want to, I'm going to kind of, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to kind of breeze through this. If you want a little bit more in depth, check out the breakdown show. Marcel Doff and Max Freeman, they do a wonderful job. Those guys are funny and they're just really good at what they do. So let's get to it. We had 13 fights, we're down to 12. I actually, a lot of people are complaining about the quality of the card. I think it's a little lacking. I think it's a pretty solid card. I think it's missing a, a co main event. That's what's missing out on it. But the rest of the card, I think, is very solid, especially from a prospect standpoint. There's a lot of prospects like, which gets to the very first fight Sabina Mazel versus JJ Aldridge. These are two girls I really like in the flyweight division. Mazel's a little bigger than Aldridge. Aldridge looks like a girl that could actually get down to strawweight. But uh, she's grindy. I mean, she gave, I mean, she was beat in Macy Barber, who we're also going to see on this card. She was beat in Macy Barber. Uh, Sabina Mazel, uh, terrible performance in her first fight against Marina Moraz. She followed up with a very good performance against Shayna. Uh, Dobson, but she really needed her wrestling in that, and I don't think we're going to see that in this fight. So I'm going to go with J.J. Aldridge, but I'm not very confident in that fight. So don't pick it. The second fight of the night, we have Brian Keller, Mr. Boom himself, going against O'Day Osborne. Uh, Keller with a long layoff. I think he's been out for over a year. He's on a two-fight losing streak. Ode Osborne is a guy that got a contract off the contender series. When I did research on, on Ode Osborne, if you don't know, I do all the previews for Sure Dog. So I got to watch you know, all the contender series previews, I should say, for Sure Dog, where I have to go in and watch film on these young fighters. Ode Osborne is a guy that I really like. He's a very good athlete, very fast, accurate hands, very explosive. He's actually he's well-rounded, good wrestler. I think he was a, a, a multiple-time wrestling state champion and brian keller is a guy that i i don't know he's 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 probably tougher than he is skilled and eventually that always catches up to these guys he's already on two fight losing streak he's been out for a while he's already talked about how the weight cut is affected him this time this guy who struggled on the regional scene with making weight so all that added together i'm gonna take oday osborne moving on the final fight on the early prelims, we have Alexa Kamer versus Justin. De- Kamer is another guy who's making his UFC debut. Also came off the contender series. This guy who's got, I think he's 5-0. and All his wins by Nako. He trains with Stephen Miocic. He's going against Justin Ledette. Ledette's on a two-fight losing team, losing to Johnny Walker and Alexander Rakic. Uh, Ledette was a guy that had a lot of buzz about him when he was at lightweight, uh, excuse me, at heavyweight before moving down to light heavyweight. It was something where he really took advantage of the speed advantage he had. Um, Kamer's raw, though. You know, who, who, which one of these two guys who I think could make a, a quicker climb up the ranks in, you know, become a top 10, top 15 guy? I would definitely lean Kamer. But right now, 
Um, he's really too raw. Ledette is a good boxer. He worked behind a, a stiff jab, and he's underrated on the ground. He's a submission threat, too. So, um, ah, man, this, I did pick just Ledette to beat Johnny Walker. I made, That made me look terrible, but I'm going to double down again. I'm going to say Justin Ledette actually comes through as a very slight underdog and gets the win. Moving on to the ESPN prelims, I'm going to have to speed this up a little bit because I'm spending too much time. We had we have Drew Dober versus Nasrat Hakpras. This is a fight I really like. I actually like Drew Dober. He, I think he's much better than his record indicates. Um, this is a guy that he's he's just really he's been coming onto his own. A lot of power, good kickboxer. But I, I wonder. I mean, I, th- I, I got to pull it up right here. I think he's on a. What is it? A. I'm sorry. This is great. This is really great radio. When you listen to me pull up a fight record, and of course it's the computer's freezing. As I'm saying, this is really not giving me his. Uh, he's won four of his last five. But his only loss to Benil Darius. No, no shame on that one. When you look at the guys he's beaten, Polo Reyes, John Tuck, Frank Camacho, and Josh Burke, none of those guys really jump off the board. They're much further down. Then Nazra Hakvaras. Hakvaras has looked really, really good lately um, in his in his last couple of fights. The fight that really made me stop believing him is, is how decisive he took out. Uh, I shouldn't say took out, but dominated Mark Diacasey. Joe Kim Silva with a knockout of the last fight. Those are really good ones. I'm just gonna I, I'm just gonna go with the with the upside in in, in Nasrat Hakparas and, and a lot of people are high on him and, I, and I'm starting to really be convinced of this guy. So I'm going to take Nasrat Hakparas to get the win. The fight that was originally supposed to be on the early prelims has been moved to the ESP prelims is uh, former title challenger Tim Elliott versus Asker Askarov. We should say Marcel Doss, boyfriend himself, Asker Askarov. This fight is replacing or it got moved up to the ESPN prelims after the Chess Skelly Grant Dawson fight got canceled. Man, I love this fight. I love, 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 love this fight. I, I think we're going to have some fantastic wrestling exchanges. T- Tim Elliott is this weird, herky jerky striker, and he loves, I mean, he's really good at scrambling and, and high wrestling, high low wrestling. And then ask her, ask her, I don't know if there's anybody in re- you know in the game that's more fun on the ground and scrambles how quick he has back takes. Um, cardio is a big issue for Askarov, but Elliot's fight IQ. Elliot is the guy that will like, lose dominant position going for something funky. Um, this is a hard one to pick, which is I'm going to say this right now. This is my fight of the night. Lock it up. This is my fight of the night. I'm going to take Asker Askarov in a very fun, crazy scramble. I think he's going to catch Tim Elliott in the second round in the submission, but as of some really, really funny back and forth fight. This is my fight of the night. And that fight of the night pick just beating out this pick, which is Andre Feely versus – Sadiq Yusuf, these are two guys I really like. I mean, Andre Feely, I think he's won four of his last five. He really could have won five of five because I thought he won. I thought he should have got the win over Michael Johnson. Uh, that said, I also think he could have got the loss against Dennis Bermuda. So I guess, you know, either way, they kind of cancel each other. Out. Unless you're <laughs> Dennis Bermuda, you probably disagree with that. Uh, City Goose is a guy that uh, when I did tape study on and the contend series, I would just show shock, shocks. And he went against Mike Davis on the show, another guy I was really high on. So um, Shaman Rice is a guy that I know I'm big on. I think uh, uh, Marcel Dolph is also big on. We both think he should have been cut. But Gabriel Benitez, this guy has been doing very well. So to get those, he's got a couple quality wins. He's getting his first true test against Andre Feely. Sadiq Yusuf is the guy that I truly believe could be a title contender. So um, I keep thinking about this fight, and I'm getting that feeling. It's going to be like that first real big setback. Um, but I'm going to go against my gut and go with my brain and say I, I've been back in Sadiq Yusuf. I'm going to take him to get the win. Uh, before that, former – I'm sorry, after that, the ESPN – Featured pre, uh, prelims featured fight. We have former title challenger Roxanne Matafari taking on the future Macy Barber, the girl that has been bold and brash and saying that she 
wants to break John Jones's record. She's coming into this fight with an absolute destruction of Jillian Robertson, another girl that I think is a pretty good prospect. Before that, she got a TKO over JJ Aldra. I mean, that's two really good wins in a row. But she's getting her toughest test, Roxanne Modify. Roxanne, she she she's been, you know, she's a true veteran of the sport. She's been fighting for 17 years, almost as long as Mason Barbers Alive. But Roxanne, who is you know, her nickname is the Happy Warrior. She's not someone who trash talk. But the closest she ever did, I think, of trash talk is saying that she's been training in martial arts longer than Macy Barber has been born. But the problem is, we know Roxanne. She's tough. She's tricky. She's crafty. She's going to try to want to get this fight to the ground where she, um, I mean, she's got some pretty good jujitsu in her game. But Macy Barber is explosive, mean. She's got a killer instinct, um, super confident. And going back to the J.J. Aldridge fight, she, like, after she dropped in the first round, she didn't, like, she didn't get frustrated. I think she just came out more aggressive and took her and, 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 and just seemed like she was like, okay, now's my time to take her out. And she did. I'm going to go with Macy Barber. She's a huge, huge favorite. She's negative nine. I'm not saying bet it, but because, you know, I, I'm going to put this in. So Mark's, Max and Marcel do their lock it up. So if you're in like a survivor pool or one where you have to just pick one fighter win, if I'm in a pool like that, which I actually am in, I gotta send my pick over to uh, the great Sean Better of Kate Side Press. Uh, I'm gonna take Macy Barber. I'm gonna as my lock. I'm gonna take her by decision. Roxanne Lafar is very hard to finish, so I'm gonna say Macy Barber by decision. Oh, another one. I had a I had a pick for my uh, my best bet. So if I if you like to gamble, and I, I forgot to say this one in an earlier fight, I'm gonna go all the way back to Ode Osborne versus Brian Keller. I really like Ode Osborne, and the odds on this fight is not bad um i'm gonna pull it up this i use five dimes their lines are ode osborne is currently one negative 145 i kind of like that line i think it should be a little higher i like it maybe at like negative one but this is a step up in competition this is definitely the toughest opponents going against brian keller a guy who has a lot more experience but i'm betting on just pure potential i like oday osborne so if i'm if i have you know i'm not a big gambler but if i had 20 bucks and i wanted to throw it down on somebody i would bet oday osborne that's my bet of the day but please if you bet please bet responsibly don't be betting your rent don't be betting you know your mortgage or car payments or you know make sure you can handle your bills only only bet if you can do it responsibly now onto the main card, a fight that was originally expected to be, or even was, I think it was even announced to be the co-main event, and then somehow got put all the way down to the to kick off the main card. But it's weird on the countdown show they they previewed obviously Conor McGregor and Donald Cerrone, and then the other fight they previewed was this fight. We have former UFC lightweight champion, WEC champion Anthony Showtime Pettis, one of the most popular fighters in the sport. He's going against. Four to seven May. There you go. I can't go through a show without mentioning four to seven May. Four to seven May's own Diego Feja, as as I like still to say, Carlos Diego Feja. Uh, is that Carlos? I mean, I know Matt uh, Marcel. I keep bringing up. I know Marcel likes to call him Carlos Diego Feja. I call him the same. Did they did he drop drop that? Like I, I've been hearing Diego Feja instead of Carlos Diego Feja. But anyways. Diego Ferreira is, I mean, he's never looked better. He's on, he's on a five foot win streak, but he's, he's already 34 years old. He's really turned his career around going to Fortis MA, which I think is one of the best teams. Anthony Pettis has been alternating wins and losses all the way back since he lost the belt to Rafael uh, Dos Anjos. He's back down to lightweight where I actually think he looks worse, the drain body. When he went up to welterweight, he just looked better up in that weight class. I mean, with the knockout of Stephen Thompson. Um, I was very impressed with Fahez's last fight against Mirabek Tyson off, where he um, he just seemed to get stronger as a rounds got. Now, this is a high-level just a guy who's been really improving in striking, and then he becomes a volume striker. I just seems like that's a really bad bad uh, matchup for Anthony Pettis. He's got to watch out for the the power of Pettis, obviously the kicks, the punches. I mean, he's got power. But if he can avoid the power, I really like Fahad to really kind of, even though he is the favorite in this one, to kind of springboard himself into uh, a top 15 ranking, start getting bigger matchups. 
Uh, one of the hardest fights is the next one, Claudia Gadelia versus Alexa Grasso. The Claudia Gadelia in her prime, I don't think she's in her prime, but at one point, if you told me this matchup, I would have been very confident in Claudia Gadelia. This girl came out like a bull, pick it up, slamming girls, great ground game, but she's really changed. She's been kind of gun shy. I don't know if it's because in the past she's a guest, uh, but she does not look good. Um, and then, I mean, I'm talking about in the cage. She looks good all the time outside the cage. Um, and she's going to get to Alexa Grasso, another girl who looks good outside the cage. Um, Alexa is a very good, uh, like point kickbox, a high volume. I was very impressed in her her fight against Carolina Kova Cave, which where she just pieced her up. Carla Espaza, she almost came away. A lot of people thought she could have got a draw against Carla Espaza. Um, she's really peaking. The problem is the physical advantage is just a pure strength. Um, I still got to go Claudia Gadea. I'm not feeling confident I would years ago, but I'm going to have to go with Claudia Gadelia. If she can get this fight to the ground, she should have an advantage. But uh, I, I'm not betting it. I would stay away from it. I, I mean, I, I'm not going to keep repeating that. I'm only betting one fight. If I was betting, I'd like O'Day Osborne. <clears throat> Moving on, on the main, we have Maurice Green versus Alexi Olenek, the 117 year old Alexi Olenek finds himself on the main card. I see a lot of people complaining about the Gadelia versus Alexa Grasso fight being on the main card, and I understand it because I definitely think there's another fight that you know, I think Sadiq Yusuf versus Andre Fila could really be on the main card. But if I always replace him, I actually would go with this fight. I think uh, Gadelia and Grasso means more to the rankings, but we have the crochet boss, Maurice Green and Alexi Olenek. Uh, Green is a um, you know former kickboxer, but he has nearly experience. I mean, oh gosh, this is the seventy second fight for Alexi Olenek. This is a guy. I mean, he's a submission specialist, but he's coming off two back to back first round knockout losses. One to Val- Alistair Overeem, and the last one, Walt Harris, only twelve seconds. <sighs> I'm really worried about that chin and, and Maurice Green be coming from a striking background. He is powerful. We saw that out to, you know, he's a, you know, he's known for his striking. He's a big boy, he's six, seven, uh, but he's raw. And he's also coming off a loss to Sergey Pavlovich. I'm going to go Alexi Olenek and I want to lock it in. It's my upset special. I mean, he's coming. I mean, it's not much of a, I can't say it's a big upset, but right now he's a negative one ten underdog. So you can get a little plus money on that. So just to recap, my upset special is Alexi Linick. My lock of the night is Macy Barber. My fight of the night is Asker Asker, Tim Elliott. And my uh, bet of the night is Ode Osborne over Brian Keller. So that leaves me the last two fights. I'm obviously not making any plays on either one. But... Moving on, former UFC Bantamweight champion Holly Holm is facing Raquel Pennington. This is a rematch early on in their career when Holly Holm got a split decision over Raquel Pennington. It is, let me see, I want to, I'm trying to remember what UFC that was. It was obviously before Holly Holm uh, got the knockout over Ronda Rose. It was Holly Holmes' debut in the UFC. It's all the way back at UFC 184, February 2015, so five years ago. It was the night Ronda Rousey beat up Kat Sangano, if anyone forgets. Um, I see a lot of people taking Raquel Pennington, just basically saying from that night she has improved. And in growing years, while Holly Holm has been very stagnant, she does the same thing. She hasn't really improved. Um, And I I totally understand. This is a hard pick for me. I'm going to take Holly Holm just based on her style. She's a very similar style to Caitlin Chikagian, where she will fight on the other side and throw a lot of volume, but kind of what I call air punches, like not really committing to landing the shot. But it convinces the judges. I could see her doing that, keeping her distance, throwing kicks, most of them blocks, jabbing, most of them blocks, throwing at it, do, making the noises, making the tennis noises when she attacks, and just kind of convincing. I like Holly Holm to win. I just am based on volume. 
uh, in the decision. And now moving on to the main event of the evening, we have the notorious Conor McGregor and Donald Cowboy Cerrone. Before I get to it, I just want to say um, I'm going to glaze over. I'm going to, I'm going to give a very quick prediction. We don't have a lot of time. I got to get out of here. I'm, I, I do have a solid. I got to be out before an hour. However, if you would like an in-depth preview, breaking down the fighters, breaking down the backstories, figuring out what they, where they go next. I mean, every angle possibly that could be covered on a fight. Me and John Franklin did that on the All Angles uh, podcast where you can check out on the Live Mouth MMA podcast. And honestly, you guys, check out everything on that network. We have the Not Safe for Work show with Kyle LaFred. We have the breakdown of Max and Marcel. We have me and John doing All Angles. We have Between the Links, which is a debate-type show hosted by Mike Heck, starring me, uh, me, Davis and Bacon, Craig Allen. We had the, the great Schmo as a special guest on. We had the Off the Cuff, the brand-new roundtable discussion with Mike Heck, Kyle Steele, Craig Allen, and the newest member of the Loudmouth Enemy Podcast Network, the great Drake Riggs. Uh, we have Early Stoppage, John Franklin and Craig Allen. We have been yesterday with me and Kyle Steele, and uh, obviously we have the, this show that we take. I got to get back in because I'm running out of time. I just want to say, well, I just want to give a shout out to all my boys over there. It's a really good team. We just keep growing. We have more stuff. But Conor McGregor, return of Conor McGregor, really get done. The ultimate, sh- you know, the the quick, very quick analysis is what Colin Crandall said. Conor should have the advantage on the feet. He should have the advantage in the early going. The deeper go the fight, the the more chance of Donald Cerrone has of winning and increases chance also if Donald can get to the fight to the ground. He's a very serious uh, submission there. I was going to say he was an underrated wrestler, but because the way everyone speaks about Donald Cerrone's wrestling game now, I can't say he's underrated. Everyone's saying he's underrated. So the thing is, Southpaws have always given Donald an issue. Uh, everyone, everyone talks about Conor McGregor's Left hand, and obviously it is like a Cuban missile. It is it is deadly if it touches. However, I'm really more impressed with the way he works, way range, the way he works body. He kind of distracts so much with the right hand. He throws some leg kicks. He'll kick keep to the body. All this adds up to distract you, then to land the the left hand. Uh, I like Conor McGregor. I think this is the perfect stylistic matchup. Uh, I definitely understand where Donald Cerrone could win. And I would, like I said, it's much longer breakdown on the All Angles podcast. But for the time being, I am going to take Conor McGregor. I think he's going to hurt Cerrone. I think he's going to pepper him with the right hand, pepper the body, work with kicks, and then eventually just land one of these big, perfectly shot. Uh, I think Conor gets him out early and and gets all the fans excited to get the people talking again, asking if he's back and it's the best we've ever seen him with a first round stoppage. So give me Conor McGregor first round knockout TKO Conor McGregor in the distance, whatever you want, however you want to bet it. I like Conor McGregor a lot. So there you have, there's all my picks, all 12 of them. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I go 12 and I mean, let's start off the decade. Right. Um, anything else? Uh, I want you guys to – I want you guys, if you listen to the show, I want you to be active with me. The I'm going to send out a question. My question is, do you – did you like the press conference? Did you like the positive Conor McGregor or did you not dislike You can get at me. You can send me an email. It's Keith Schillen, the number seven at Yahoo. Let me spell my last name. It is S H I L L A N. So Keith Schillen seven at Yahoo. Send me a message. Let me know if you like the press conference. If you'd rather tweet me, it's the same thing. It's at Keith Schillen M M A. So at Keith Schillen M M A. Hit me on Twitter. Let me know. Did you like the positive Connor? Is that what you want to see, or do you would you rather see the trash talking Connor? Tell me what you thought about the press conference. And guys, enjoy the fights. I mean, as I talked about there's a lot of negativity, a lot of media members being negative, a lot of fans being named, you know, Connor brings out emotions out of the people. But guys, just enjoy the fights.
the biggest star in the history of sport is coming back. He's taken on the winningest fighter in UFC history, Donald Cerrone, the most, uh, the guy with the, I was going to say most daring, but he shouldn't not most daring, but the guy with the most stoppages. Uh, you know, he's he's a record holder in multiple categories in the UFC. It's a guy who deserves it. Enjoy the moment. It doesn't have to be a belt on the line and this, that. But, uh, yeah, it, with Conor coming back, it's always good. Now, there's a lot of things he needs to answer to, especially those sexual assault allegations. But in the cage, it's good for Conor to be back. Uh, one last prediction. Actually, I'm going to get two last predictions. Uh, John Franklin asked me, who does Conor McGregor call out? I believe he calls out multiple people. But if he only calls out one, I believe it's going to be Jorge Masvidal. And my last thing, what's going to be the pay for you bias? I'm going to go with 1.2 million. That is not a just a number that I took off. That is exactly half of what the Habib fight did. I think that's that's safe. So I'm going to go 1.2 million on the pay per view buys. Anyways, guys, I'm really pressed on time. I got to get out of here. First of all, I want to thank. Colin Crandall, who came on in the second segment, he's there on location. He's a great, great guy. Make sure you check out his show, the MMA Power Hour, every Wednesday on Fight TV. He also has it on different Facebook platforms. But the easiest way to find it, go over to Fight TV. It's it's completely free. It's not one of these pay ones that they have. In there. It's completely free. You have it right on the front page. Check him out. He's got Adam over there. He's got Craig. He's got a whole crew. They really put things together. They're launching a a website. Davison Baker, our very own Davis Baker, has been working with them too. So some really good guys and really passionate. They work hard. So make sure you check them out. And guys, but you know, get, hit me up on Twitter. Make fun of my picks. Whatever you want. But enjoy the fights, and we'll be back Monday talking all about this card and and so much more. All right, thanks for listening. Goodbye.